Okay, welcome everyone. This is Lee Steichman, the presenter for this session. And I want to give a special shout out to Vicki Steiner, who made the tech work and is co-hosting this for me. Um, Vicki's with San Jose State University. So I wanted to let you all know that this is being recorded and it will be archived. And if you want to uh, send us a message, ask questions, make comments, click on chat to communicate with that. And if you do have questions, we'll try to answer them at the end of the session. And that's, I think, what we need to say on this screen. So on to the next, Vicki, if you wouldn't mind. And this is, I definitely need to honor the at San Jose State University's um, School of Information with their co-sponsoring of this conference. They're giving a lot to make it happen. So thank you guys so much. All right, on to the next. So I'm starting out as probably most in this series of, of doing by saying, what do we mean by wholehearted? There's a couple dictionary definitions you know, involving all your feelings, involving all your interests, words like sincere or unfeigned or whole sold. These are all qualities that imply practices, actually they're all adjectives that imply qualities and practices that are embodied in people and they're conveyed mostly through interpersonal relationships. The question I want to ask and hopefully answer is do the people have to be physically present to demonstrate compassion or shared humanity or empathy or curiosity for that matter? Uh, my library, the Plain Tree Health Library has been wrestling with these questions over the last three years. Specifically, the, the questions we're looking at <clears throat> is are there ways to convey librarians authentic presence online more than just being available in a synchronous chat reference can we do it with the actual static web pages themselves the back history to that is can a library that used to be known for its individual reference support face to face in a brick and mortar setting keep those wholehearted qualities when it moves to an all online environment and for that matter what's the value of a library in a community that's overabundantly supplied with online health information? Does the presence of professional librarians wholehearted qualities, as well as their professional discernment, add value to the information that's presented? So that's the questions we're trying to head towards an answer for. We don't have a definitive one, but I've got some ideas. If we could have the next one, thank you. Oh, that picture showed up a little strangely, but anyway, here's context. This is Plain Tree Health Library's story. It's not a new library. We, its origins started back in 1987 in the patient-centered care movement. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, but in part relied upon patients having access to information in order to advocate for themselves and to participate in their care. And for those first years, 1987 to 2002, it was a physical library. That's a picture of the quaint Eastlake Victorian we were located in, in downtown San Jose. Um, and in many ways, this was similar to much of the ideology that's behind public libraries in the U.S. This was a public library. Um, it became well known locally as much for the personal attention that the librarians gave to its patrons as for the ways that it gave access to health and medical information, which back in those years was difficult to access. So we opened our doors to the public in 1989. The post.com era was a difficult one for us. And I'm, this is the period 2003 to 2017. Uh, there are three major trends in healthcare and information seeking behavior that threatened that model though. The growing proliferation of online resources for wellness and health, despite the many questionable or worse resources, quality of that information, combined with the way that a large segment of our community judged themselves to be computer savvy, we're based in Silicon Valley, meant that health information seeking became largely a DIY activity. People weren't going to librarians for answers. In the same era, healthcare systems, who were the logical partners for Plain Tree Health Library, many of them, most of them in our, in our county, converted to for-profit enterprises. So patient ed education became increasingly thought of as a proprietary product, not a public good. And then the dot-com real estate boom hit. And like most nonprofit organizations in our area, we struggled to find a, a stable home. So in the second 15 years of its existence, Plain Tree Health Library tried partnerships with many different organizations to try to stay open and viable with some successes, but 
ultimately that second model was deemed to be as unsustainable as the prior model. So after much de deliberation, the board of directors decided in 2016 to reinvent Plaintree Health Library, primarily as an online library. So we're a library of librarian curated links. It also decided to focus its collections, not on everything health, which is just too wide to cover, um, but to focus on key issues for our communities. And they wanted to choose one specific and delve deeply into that so it could really give a fair amount of solid information for that segment of our community's population. Um, and so I was hired as the new executive director in 2017. And the board decided at that time to specialize our collections on information for healthy aging, the aging well, but also the issues of later life, uh, all the way up to end of life. Uh, in part, that decision was made because people 60 and older are now approximately 90% of the total population of Santa Clara County. They're outpacing young people to the extent that within 10 years, folks 60 and older are expected to be around a third, 30% or more of the total population. And at the same time, a rather shocking percentage of people in California are family caregivers for their elders. So even though we're concentrating on one subject area, if you want to think of it that way, this is one that touches a large percentage of the population in the counties that we, the county we serve. So funding a nonprofit organization is always a challenge, and I do want to acknowledge that. Being independent of for-profit healthcare is necessary for our credibility, for the credibility of our information services. So where does our funding come from? We do have an endowment, and that endowment is the legacy of the wholehearted reference services that the earlier models for Plain Tree Health Care gave us. It was the compassion, the empathy, the support over time that our reference librarians gave to the people coming to us for it help with their information questions, their, I'm sorry, their information, health information questions. And that's where the donations came from that created our endowment. And that's allowed us to continue in the last decade, but we're not clear what the new financial model is going to be. So I also want to acknowledge that. Let's next slide, I think. That's our context. I don't just want to talk about Plain Tree Health Library, though. The, the value of this is whether it's going to be useful to other types of libraries. And I think there are many aspects where our story intersect with other libraries, as well as the theme of this conference. At core, what I'm going to be talking about really is about paying attention to the whole person in health education and in reference services. And I want to start with by talking with what do we mean by patient-centered. Patient-centered, quite frankly, from the librarian's perspective, is exactly the same as, thing as user-centered or patron-centered. Um, it explicitly addresses the whole person. The definition of what this means, this is from the book called Putting Patients First that was put out by Plain Tree International, the parent organization behind this movement. And to quote, there. Their definition is it expands the traditional protocol for providing standardized educational resources about a patient's condition to offering information based on the personal interests and requests of the patient and beyond, including family members to the extent that the patient desires. So it's addressing the whole person. Even though at our reference desks at our public libraries, we may get one or two questions, my understanding, certainly my experience of working with my colleagues, is they always try to, act, to address the whole person's information needs and the whole person's other needs if it's appropriate. So I think we think about the whole person, not just the question that presents to us across the desk. It's, and I, that's why I'm saying they both need to address the effective dom domains, the, the success of health education and also of reference services of any kind depend on how well they address the effective domains, the emotional side of information seeking in order to successfully meet the patron's needs. Um, there's a, another source called uh, Health Literacy from A to Z. It's a standard textbook for health education. And it's quoting a podcast that talks about, this is about health education, but I think we can all see this as part of reference in all libraries. Readers can feel respected and valued when two things happen. One, when they understand the text, then they actually get whatever's being said by the words and graphics. 
The second is when they feel as though the text itself responds to them emotionally. Good information design centers the reader's likely emotional response to text and graphics. We know from years of research that reading isn't just an intellectual cognitive ability, activity, sorry. It's an emotional activity as well. That sounds an awful lot like Kalthau's information um, search process model that I learned back in library school. So I think there's a lot of parallels here. It also intersects with some of the other factors in, around psychological ability to understand the information that's being given. And other folks have addressed this as thinking about the intersections of health information and reference service. There was even an article by Wilmoth that was envisioning a health, I'm sorry, envisioning a reference interview as crisis intervention. She was mostly looking at it as reference librarians helping with crisis intervention act activities. But I would argue that someone who's coming with a health question is probably emotionally charged, might be triggered, anxious, nervous, afraid, and that what we do in the reference interview is in fact a crisis intervention. So, and one of the things that we've also learned, first, I learned it first through Kalthaus theories, but certainly we've all seen how it plays out in the information seeking behavior literature, is that acknowledging that there is an emotional aspect to information seeking just by itself can improve the experience. It can lessen the isolation. And that touches on to mindfulness experiences, which is the theme of some of the other um, presentations in this conference. So I think that these are all interlocked. The other thing I want to point out is that the studies that have been done about people looking for health information I think may well turn out to be a good representative sample of adult information seeking behavior in general. Um, so who's doing the searching? Uh, people who have health questions themselves or family caregivers. Some studies, both one by the NCBI and another by Pew Internet, um, are saying that actually 50% of the questions that people ask when they're looking for health information online period in their sample um, were people who had general health questions for themselves, but 72% were pe people who had questions for a family member or someone they were caring for as well as themselves. There's some overlap there. So I think there, it, and I could go more into that. Um, another important point is that avid healthcare information seekers, this is from the NCBI study in 2019, are much more likely to use mobile devices to search the internet than other folks who may have a health interest, but not a particular emergent need. So that's another part there as well. Next slide, please. So how do you show a patient-centered viewpoint in written text? The very first point, and a lot of this information I'm drawing from is from the Health, health Education A to Z, as well as a, a wide range of sources I've read. Um, there's a list at the back of this presentation, a bibliography of the ones that I'm alluding to. Um, is to write to, directly to, the patient or the patron or the user. And some of that plays out in your organizational arrangement. What I'm showing here, the two versions of the screen here, um, one is, the one on the right-hand side, is our, these are all Plaintree Health Library's websites, is the webpage design that came up in, somewhere in that middle era, 2012, 2010, uh, which is organized like a librarian would think of it. This is the section under making healthy choices for yourself and your family. And this is very much the way that any uh, cataloging scheme would look at it. You start with the more comprehensive sites and then you pick out individual aspects that may or may not be related to each other and go on to uh, further and further narrower definitions of it. The other, the caregiving basics is from our guide to uh, caregiving resources, and I should back up and explain this part. The Later Life Resource Guides project is actually three parts. One part is common issues of aging, the other is information for caregivers, and the third one is about planning for later life, advanced care planning. And the one on the right uses standard HTML coding. The one on the left, we're taking advantage of SpringShare's LibGuide software. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And allowing that to um, 
drill down, but you see how each of these categories is talking specifically about an aspect of caregiving. There's, some of them are mirrored in the common issues of later life, but it's talking there to the person who's experiencing it. Here we're talking to the person who's caring for, caring for someone else. So I think that's an, an, an important part here. Um, the other thing that I, I think we should do here is to normalize the most common experiences that people have. Rather than writing informational materials only to the rare but disastrous cases or the squeaky wheels, bring to the fore the most commonly experienced conditions, even if they're not necessarily ones that are of huge anxiety, but they're all present for everyone. That increases the sense of we see you, the whole person, and this might be an issue or not. Um, next slide, please. Speak directly to the person who needs the information, as I said before, and give them enough context for them to make a decision. This is a section from our guide on common issues of later life. So this is talking to people who are experiencing the condition. And this is part of the section on memory loss, forgetfulness, and dementia. So we're talking here about someone who might be suspecting that they're having memory problems and immediately goes directly to, oh my God, I've got dementia. And so the advice that's being given here is don't immediately jump to the conclusion that it's dementia. We're addressing the fact that, yeah, they're probably pretty, pretty scared and pretty upset. Um, and instead, here's some other things to think about, but be sure to talk to your healthcare team if any of these seems likely. So that's a, a big piece of it there. Um, another part here is not only talking about what can affect it, but the circularity, the feedback loops of many healthcare states. You know, stress, depression, and anxiety can also affect memory, but worrying about losing memory can add to your stress, you know, so that there is that issue as well. Um, and this doesn't say this is your diagnosis. We're absolutely not qualified to do that. There's no way we're going to do that, but it gives people enough information to think about factors to bring up in that conversation with their healthcare team, which is fraught for many reasons in this country. And I won't go into that, but I'm sure you all have experienced it yourselves. Next slide, please. The other thing is to use an appropriately conversational style. This is an excellent video on ways to get up if you've fallen, some things to think about how to be creative about that process. It's part of the guide on, again, common issues in later life. And this is part of the section on balance and mobility issues. But the language here is not professional to information seeker. It's despite our best efforts to fall proof our homes and ourselves, still falls happen. Now what? Hint, it's a good idea to practice getting back up again. So it's trying to convey the kind of uh, conversations we might have appropriately adult to adult across a reference desk as well. So we're talking to a real person. We're not a bot. And the, um, so next screen, please. We can also choose our words and our tone to show compassion. This is from the section on uh, planning for later life, the advanced care. And here we're talking about the, num the issues involved in thinking through what do we want at the end of our lives versus all the forms that are involved in the process. And we're saying there's no one right way. Focus on what matters to you or your loved one right now. Focus on your own values. The plans we make for ourselves at age 40 can be very different from what we want at age 40, at age 85, and should be. Major life events like a new child or moving away or important relationship changes should remind us to update our advanced care plans. And then it lists a number of places to start with things to think about. And a little further below, we're talking about um, special considerations for certain conditions. Things like, what if there is beginning of memory loss or dementia? Um, what if there is a cognitive disability? And there's the very sad category of coming up with advanced care directives for children and acknowledging that this is heartbreaking 
to consider these questions for children to have a terminal condi condition. And their parents can get some support from these sources, which have uh, conversation starter kits on how to begin the conversation about that. I also want to call out here that representation matters and language access matters. I wish I could find these materials in all the languages that are important in our county. These are just the top three right now, with Vietnamese coming very close to Chinese. But it's very important to have that, not just for transferring the information, but also for your audience to know, hey, I see you. I see that we're not all adept English speakers. So that's, a, that's another aspect of representation that says, I see you, the whole person, as well as good information uh, delivery practice. On to the next. And acknowledge emotions. This is another snippet of video from the Conversation Project that doesn't give any answers, but is very rich in showing a couple of characters practicing in front of a mirror. How do they start that conversation with their family member? Um, and the little bit of text right before this is the person is saying, I just was binge watching Game of Thrones and, and I realized everybody dies. And then, oh God, that was not the right way to approach it. So there's a series of people trying and failing. That normalizes the experience of anyone else who's trying to do this very difficult process and gives encouragement to help people, A, not feel isolated, their problem isn't their own, their own, and to try to work through that to get to the, the next step. It's a, you don't do it once and you're done. You try several times and here is some support in that process. Again, all the studies that we see about whether we acknowledge the information, the emotional or the affective component of an information task makes it so much better and cognitively makes it so much easier for us to get through that. So on to the next. I'm going to say that even with this conversational mode or this storytelling mode, we can bring the librarian's voice onto the screen. And by that, I mean not just the voice of the um, question expert, um, the question authority, as some people would say, but we're talking person to person. We may understand that in theory, our bodies will continue to change as we get older, but suddenly noticing our bodies are different now can come as an unwelcome surprise. When did that happen? Subtle, psychological, subtle physiological changes can add up until they're not so subtle anymore. When everyone's experience is unique, knowing about the most common ways our bodies tend to change as we age can make those surprising differences less of a shock or a problem. That's the introduction to the common concerns in later life section. So we're not just saying, here are things to watch out for. We're putting it in a human context. Okay, next one. Some other suggestions I have for you, um, and you've seen some illustrations there. If the information applies to human lives, show people. It seems kind of obvious, but all too often we're so focused on the words and the text. That's our meat and potatoes and our, our livelihood, but we forget how much information is conveyed through images. Photos, videos, interviews, etc., is a huge piece of it. Um, if possible, show people interacting with each other in videos. This gets to the social presence and how important that is in information uh, exchange of behavior, information seeking behavior and how well we internalize and become part of an information community. As I said, representation matters and availability in multiple languages matters as well. And I think at that point, I've been talking um, at about 25 words a minute. Um, so I wanted to take a look at what's in the chat and see if you had any questions or thoughts for us. I'm going to take a quick look at that, uh, but feel free to type more as I go. Um, yeah, Aaron points out that, you know, our career college is almost exclusive ebooks and textbooks, but expanding resources and physical space to satisfy the whole student. Absolutely. Yeah, and reference anxiety is very real across the world. Um, 
Okay, so the, there's a question about what kinds of uh, online or digital libraries those attending the conference are involved in. So feel, please feel free to add that in. Uh, and thank you for making this a, a, a community as well. Um, okay. So I'm really happy to see that people are talking about actual person-to-person -person community through computer-mediated conversation. Um, and I'm seeing some apps listed here that are, are great, Skype, phone, chat, WebEx, and so on. Um, I was actually one of the, I was working for one of the pre, I call it a pre-internet, pre-internet startup for uh, Telebase, which was one of the first chat reference services available back before there was a graphic internet. Um, which is part of where my interest comes from for this. And that was a real eye-opener in a lot of ways. Um, one, I just a side note to that. One of the interesting things about using computer-mediated com communication is without seeing the person, you're less likely to bring your visual prejudices to the interaction. But there are other kinds of prejudices that happen. And one of the issues that happened at Telebase, we were doing it by uh, IRC, Internet Relay Chat. And we would make judgments based on how adept the person was, how articulate they were, how many spelling mistakes, typing overs, and so on. And we had one uh, patron come in with a question. So it was, we were all saying, oh boy, this person's, ooh, ooh they're having a tough time. They're having a really tough time. They, they're, you could see this sort of L for loser appearing on, on people's foreheads until they outed themselves as being someone with cerebral palsy who was working on their GED. And instantaneously, that person became a hero. So I think we have to watch our prejudices in the computer-mediated communication world as much as we do in the face-to-face. -face. Um, okay. Great. I'm looking at the rest of it here. Thank you so much for, I'm glad it was, was what you guys wanted. Uh, one more slide, because I did promise to give you folks the resources that went into this. I did call out a few of them by name. Here are some of the other ones that were, went into my thinking in putting this together. This isn't my idea of the best bibliography, but it is sources that I found compelling and, and added to the conversation. So I, and I hope you guys can make good use of them as well. And. Uh, this way you don't have to worry about, how do you spell that name? You'll have this on the, on the uh, recorded version of the presentation. Okay, any other comments? Or see we're coming up towards the end of our time. Great, well, thank you folks so much for taking part. And uh, I will post these slides up in the chat. Um, and so you have a chance to look at them again. And I'd love to hear more from back from you folks, how you might use these ideas or how your experience works. The very last slide in this, go ahead and, and pick is, is how you can contact me. And it's also the URLs for our main website, but this the three specific guides that are part of the Later Life Resource Guides. Thank you guys so much for your attention. And thank you again, Vicki, for all your technical support. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I enjoyed this very much. I'm just going to, I'm putting your email address in the chat window Great. for folks who would like to take advantage of your kind offer. Great. And well, thank I hope you very much. I, this was a fantastic presentation. You're very welcome. And I'm looking forward to some of the rest of them now that I'm off shift on the desk. Yes. <laughs> All right. And so if you, uh, unless you would like to uh, field some more questions, um, you can go ahead and click to stop the recording. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any more in the chat. So last call, folks. Nope. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All righty. I'll go ahead and stop. Thank you again. Thank you, Lisa. You take care. Okay. Take care, everybody. Okay. <laughs>